I welcome you to our forum co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters, the Dispute Resolution Center, and the Washtenaw County Bar Association. This evening, we feature candidates for Judge of Circuit Court, 22nd Circuit. These candidates will be on the ballot for the election on Tuesday, August 4th, which is a primary. This year, the League of Women Voters is celebrating 100 years of expanding voter rights, educating voters, and shaping and influencing legislation at local, state, and national levels. The League is very pleased to co-sponsor these forums. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization that works to increase understanding of major public policy issues to strengthen and broaden knowledge about our form of government and democracy. While the League does not support individual candidates or parties, we do take stands on issues we have studied. And one of the League's most important goals is to assist voters in making informed choices at the polls. And thus, we are happy to bring you tonight's program. Our moderator this evening is Belinda Doolin from the Dispute Resolution Center, who will explain the format and get us started. Ms. Doolin? Thank you, Ms. Deshawn. And now it's my honor to introduce the three candidates running for the 22nd Circuit Court Judge. We have Amy Reiser, Nick Rommel, and Tracy Vandenberg. Thank you candidates for, being, for participating in tonight's forum. Before we get started with the questions, there are a few things I wanna uh, alert you to in terms of the format. Each candidate will have an opening statement of up to one minute. Each candidate will have a closing statement of up to 90 seconds. In between, I will ask questions that have come from the Washtenaw County community. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question. At appropriate times, a sign on the screen will indicate the time remaining, 30 seconds, and then stop. If you have used up your time, you will be allowed to finish your sentence, and then your microphone will be muted so that other candidates will have equal opportunity to participate. The candidates will begin speaking in alphabetical order. Dependent on the number of questions, all candidates will have an opportunity to be the first or the last to answer a question. We are now ready for your opening statements and we'll begin with Ms. Reiser. Thank you very much. My name is Amy Reiser. Thank you for having me this evening. I'm running for 22nd Circuit Court, Washtenaw County Judge. I've lived in Washtenaw County since 2002. I bought my first home in Ypsilanti, and I currently reside in Dexter Township with my husband and our two children uh, who both go to public schools. I've been an assistant prosecuting attorney for uh, the majority of my career, uh, 21 years. I went to uh, Western Michigan University and then to the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law. I worked at the Women's Justice Center and I've been an assistant prosecutor for the last 21 years representing victims of sexual assault, child abuse, and domestic violence. To learn more about my campaign, my website is amyreiser.com. Please vote on August 4th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rommel. Unmute yourself. Thank you. I have done so. I'm Nick Rommel. I'm a civil rights attorney running for county court. I am grandson of four Greek immigrants. I was the first of my family to attend college and worked my way through the University of Michigan and Wayne State Law School. I am married to Gail Altenberg, a juvenile court referee. We have three daughters and five grandchildren. I offer the most extensive experience in any candidate in this race in all three areas that the circuit court hears, family, civil, and criminal. I have uh, my non-legal background includes child psychology, crisis intervention, and education. I have a commitment to giving back to my community. I have 45 years of various social justice causes. I have the respect of my peers. I was the highest rated attorney in the judicial poll from the Washtenaw County Bar Association in all categories. I have over 300 endorsements from your Attorney General Dana Nessel to judges, unions, and others. I look forward to talking with you more today. Thank you. Thank Thank you. And Ms. Vandenberg. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me tonight. My name is Tracy Vandenberg. I'm a trial lawyer with expertise in family law and a clinical social worker running to be your next circuit court judge. The open family court, excuse me, the open seat has been designated a family court seat, and I am uniquely qualified to fill it. My expertise in family law is unparalleled by any other candidate. I've represented numerous individuals at trial and on appeal and up to the Supreme Court. And it's going to allow me to make accurate legal decisions. And my training and experience treating families gives me professional insight into the family dynamics and issues such as substance abuse, domestic violence, and mental health that come before the court. Now, could this seat change to a non-family law seat when the new judge comes in in two years? It could, and look, I have experience in every area of the law that comes before the family court, criminal, civil litigation, family, and probate. But the fact is, the seat should not change in two years. Our Washtenaw families deserve a judge who will stay with them long-term, has a passion for doing family law, and has the expertise to help them, not a judge each time someone is elected. Thank you, Ms. Vandenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the, all the candidates for their opening statements. And now we're going to start with our questions. I will ask uh, or read the questions to you one time, and it will not be repeated unless you request it. Uh, to begin, we will start with Ms. Reiser with the first question. I'm sorry. Let me start again. We will start with Mr. Rommel with the first question. I'm very sorry about that. Mr. Rommel, please unmute yourself and I'll read the question. How will your experience and training influence your decisions on the bench as it relates to substance abuse, mental illness, and domestic violence? Mr. Rommel? Um, my, would you please repeat the question? Because I could have sworn you said you were asking Ms. Reiser the first question. That was my mistake. And it was okay. the first question is actually for you. So I apologize for that. I'll repeat it. How will your experience and training influence your decisions on the bench as it relates to substance abuse, mental illness, and domestic violence? Sure. Thank you. So the first cases that I did when I was a, uh, an you know, practicing law in Detroit were on behalf of domestic violence victims. And that was uh, over 35 years ago. And I have represented them both in um, civil uh, injunction and PPO litigation, as well as in civil lawsuits, up to and including the Nassar survivors that I currently represent. What I've learned is that when you suffer a trauma of that kind. It affects your life like the stone thrown in a pond that has a ripple effect on the rest of your life. It affects your ability to earn income. It affects your mental health. It affects your propensity to use substances. And I have a background in psychology, crisis intervention, and 36 years of representing victims of trauma in all kinds of cases from domestic violence uh, to um, to wrongful death and um, child suicide. So I'm well versed in the kinds of cases that people have. I know that when a trauma is suffered by somebody that it often leads to things like substance abuse, that it leads to mental health issues. And the resources we have in this that are available to people are not always accessible. Uh, for example, we have enough trouble with access to the courts. And once you get into the courts, then you have an issue with getting access to the treatment that you need with mental health and substance use. We have some terrific uh, resources in the county. And one of the things that I like to talk about is a holistic approach so that when somebody comes before the court that the judge is aware of and knows these resources so that we can do a holistic approach to serving the litigants who come before us, not just that their cases are resolved, but so that they can have their lives uh, put back on the right track with uh, hopefully some hope for the future. Thank you, Mr. Rommel. Ms. Vandenberg. Un yeah. 
Absolutely. Well, as I mentioned, I'm a trained clinical social worker. I have a bachelor's and master's degree in social work from New York University. I was a licensed social worker in New York. I ran a mental health day treatment program for adolescents, keeping them out of the justice system who were suffering from substance abuse and psychiatric issues. I was also a staff psychotherapist at an uh, adult day treatment facility for adults with um, significant psychiatric illnesses. I also ran a family program for families who had children who were suffering from substance abuse. So I have um, not only you know, trained in diagnosis, individual, group, and family therapy, I treated families for many years. And as a matter of fact, I also worked in pediatrics where I evaluated child abuse cases. Um, so my professional training in another discipline um, makes me uniquely qualified to understand the components of mental health and substance abuse and to make sure that people are getting the appropriate treatment. For example, let's talk about trauma. Um, you know, many uh, domestic violence victims suffer from PTSD. And it's still very surprising that judges don't understand that the sequela of trauma is actually changes in the brain. And that often makes a domestic violence victim not the best witness because trauma and PTSD by its nature interferes with an individual's memory, with an individual's affect, which is the way they speak. They may talk like this or they may not cry. And then the judge who's uninformed about trauma doesn't realize that person's not crying because they've depersonalized. I don't want to get too technical, but of course my, my training as a mental health professional is going to inform the way I assess individuals in the court and in the way that I make sure people are getting the help they need, which is what something that I'm very committed to. When I was a lawyer at Legal Services of South Central Michigan, I had social work students under my supervision who provided ancillary services, and I'll do the same at the court. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Reiser. Thank you. Uh, my experience uh, working with substance abuse, uh, both offenders and victims, um, working with those who suffer from mental illness, and especially uh, working with domestic violence victims uh, for the past 21 years will probably be the biggest asset that I bring to the circuit court bench. Uh, I started my undergraduate degree at Western Michigan University, and then the circuit court in Kalamazoo County had a substance abuse diversion program for women who were charged with felony uh, controlled substance cases. And it was a diversion program to help those women get their lives back together. I worked at the Women's Justice Center representing uh, victims in the domestic violence uh, shelters in, Was in Wayne County, I'm sorry. And I've spent the last almost 20 years here in Washtenaw County uh, representing the voice of sexual assault and domestic violence victims. So the way that that will translate uh, and help on the family court bench is I will be able to recognize the factors, uh, the red flags, the power and control that um, occurs in a domestic violence relationship when I'm handling the PPO docket, uh, when I'm handling a divorce uh, case, I'll be able to recognize those factors in domestic violence relationships to say, maybe these individuals don't need to be sent to mediation because there are signs of domestic violence. I've worked extensively with the mental health court in 15th district court, uh, both with victims uh, who have been um, involved in the mental health court and also been a victim of a crime. And when appropriate, I send offenders there. If there's someone that's charged with a crime and they suffer from a mental illness, um, if we can protect society um, and send them to mental health court to get the help that they need, that's what I've done for the last 21 years. So I think in this area, I have the most experience uh, to bring to the circuit court bench. Thank you. You're welcome. The next question. The circuit court addresses families that are, who are separating and divorcing. We know that parenting time factors establish guidelines for decisions. Do you believe that there should be a presumption of 50-50 parenting time for both parents? What factors will you evaluate specifically to award parenting time? And we'll begin with Ms. Vandenberg. Absolutely. So I'll tell you right off the bat that I'm strongly against a presumption of 50-50 custody. Um, disproportionately, the presumption um, has negative consequences for domestic violence survivors, 
Um, a lot of people who are uninformed in family law think it sounds like a good idea, but when you really look at the effects of that presumption and um, the, the counsel of the state bar of family court attorneys have lobbied against that um, presumption for many, many years because they know how detrimental it would be. Um, in evaluating a custody situation, the court looks at the parenting time factors and the 12 best interest custody factors. I would be strictly applying those factors um, in terms of a parenting time change. Now, not to get too technical, but the reality is the first step is always to make sure we're actually talking about parenting time and not custody. Because if it's an actual, if, if the change would actually result, if the, the change is so dramatic that would actually result in a change of custody, there is actually a statutory framework that needs to be in play beforehand. So again, um, the best interest factors are willingness and ability of the uh, parent to facilitate a relationship uh, with the other parent, ability to provide medical care, food, love, guidance, the moral fitnesses of the parties. I'd be applying all of these factors and determining um, at times, we actually look at whether or not um, we talk to the child. Um, and I would be applying those statutory best interest factors and in making the determination if parenting time could change. And also making sure parenting time wouldn't change custody. We have to check that first under Bud Varga. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Reiser. Thank you. There you go. Sorry, couldn't find the button. I think uh, I don't believe that every case should be presumed a 50-50 uh, parenting time split between the parents. The family is obviously going through a very traumatic time. I think you look at the best interests for the children uh, and you uh, have to look at each case um, on an individual basis. Uh, is there an allegation of abuse by one parent or the other? Uh, that that's a big thing that we'll be looking for uh, in my court if I'm seated as a judge. Uh, is one parent staying in the school district where the children go to school? Uh, medical um, interest for the child uh, to get the child to and from the doctor. So I think that there are a lot of factors to consider. I would follow the statute, but I would not in every case presume that it should be 50-50. I think you have to hear from each side. And if the children are old enough, you, you talk to the children. But I do know from my experience in, in handling um, these types of cases, it's a very, uh, a traumatic experience for the family and the children to come to court and sometimes uh, the individuals sort of lose their sense of reality and the children can often become pawns um, in this divorce case so I'd like to be able to recognize that and evaluate each case uh, individually uh, before making that decision. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rommel. I know the 50-50 is a movement that uh, some advocacy groups are pushing. Illinois has just passed the statute. It interferes with the judge's discretion in a lot of ways, and it also changes the analysis when you start with a legal presumption rather than you approach a goal. Let's take, for example, my own situation. I, I mentioned that I'm the parent of three daughters. Two of them are my stepdaughters. And, you know, it was a terrific relationship that we had as stepfather with the biological father and with the mother. The goal is definitely to have a stable and a nurturing environment for, for with all the parents uh, and extended families are great for kids. You do uh, want to have that as a goal, but not necessarily a presumption so that you can apply the best interest factors uh, carefully and make sure that to me, the mo two of the most important ones are the ability to provide a stable and nurturing environment for the child and the ability to foster a relationship with the other parent. Now, of course, in a domestic violence situation, you change the analysis. The new court rules in Michigan require judges to do, require the friend of court to do a, um, an analysis of whether domestic violence has occurred um, to do a screening before um, at the initial stages of a case. If when I'm elected, I'm gonna make sure we do a secondary screening for that. So I'm gonna make sure that we look at uh, not just the obvious signs of domestic violence, such as has there been a police report, has there been a conviction, has there been a PPO, but also some of the secondary, uh, the secondary um, characteristics that a domestic violence sufferer may, may exhibit and not necessarily hold them against that person. Because what we do see, and 
it is true that a, a domestic violence sufferer does not necessarily present well in court. And I have to look beyond that in order to make sure that everybody gets a fair shake, again, with the goal that every parent has a good relationship with a child if they're not harming the child. Thank you. We'll move to our next question. And we'll begin with Ms. Reiser on the third question. Cases in which one party represents, um, I'm sorry, let me start again. Cases in which one party represents oneself in a court case and does not have an attorney is known as pro per. Michigan courts seems to be trending upwards in pro per parties to cases. How would you handle pro per parties and would you have a separate docket? Why or why not? So I would, uh, I think having a separate docket is it may be a good idea if there are uh, several uh, individuals representing themselves. I think you have to allow them a little bit more time and a little bit more leeway um, in navigating the court system. And it's certainly understandable that a lot of individuals in our community may not have the money or the resources uh, to hire an attorney and, and get a divorce and um, deal with child custody if children are involved. So that's a definite reality. And I think that you um, have to allow them the opportunity to be heard and listen Listen to each side. If they're both uh, representing themselves, they both get an opportunity to be heard. And if they're representing themselves and the other side has an attorney, uh, I would listen equally to both sides, understanding that they may not know the intricacies of the court uh, or the court rules or the procedure, but to the extent that the judge can help in that, um, I would definitely be understanding and compassionate for those that have to do that. I know um, in probating my own dad's estate, I had to do that in 2006 in Wayne County when he was killed. And me as an attorney, uh, it was difficult. This, this, the court system was overwhelming. So I know that um, people do need to end relationships, unfortunately, end marriages. And if they have to come before me um, and deal with that case, I'll listen to them just as much as I would listen to uh, someone who is represented by an attorney. I would definitely not hold that against them. And I think if I um, am elected to the bench and there are a number of cases uh, where individuals are representing themselves, I would definitely consider having a docket for just those who are representing themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rommel. Thank you. Having a separate docket is treating the symptom and not the underlying problem. The underlying problem is access to justice. We have a very prohibitive justice system. One of the things I've talked about in my campaign is top to bottom re-examination and reimagination of our court system to make it a better and a friendlier place to people without means, to people of color, and to those who feel discouraged and shut out of our justice system. I have a friend who says, I'm living apart from my wife. We have our own place. We've divided our property. We have no kids. Why do I have to have $1,000 to pay an attorney just to get a divorce? You can walk into the clerk's office, fill out a piece of paper and get married. Why do you have to start a lawsuit in order to dissolve that marriage peaceably. What I'd like to do is again, have an examination of the justice system where we partner with legislators, where we look at different ways to make divorce more of an administrative thing in cases like that, because it's a terrible place. If you are unrepresented, you are scared, you're intimidated by the court, you have trouble parking, you have trouble with transportation, you get down to court, you don't know what to say, you don't know how to cite the best interest factors, you don't know how to represent yourself, have a separate docket, you know, I mean, I'm going to listen to everybody with kindness, respect, and patience, whether it's a separate docket or with the attorneys, and I really don't want to have a caste system in my court. You know, everybody's welcome in my courtroom. So what we need to do is fix that broader problem of access to justice, and that's what I stand for. Thank you. Ms. Vandenberg? Absolutely. You know, I've, I've seen the separate docket work. Judge Conlon currently has a separate docket. And, you know, I think effectively he does that so that he can give extra time to the pro per individual self-represented litigants. Um, 
and you know spend more time with them while attorneys might get it in and out of there a little more quickly. So I think that can be one tool that we use. Um, something that I'm planning on implementing is um, divorce workshops monthly where people are given, they can come, they can learn about the, the how to get a divorce. We will have um, forms on hand and packets to walk them through the process. Um, you know, I think one of the trickiest areas, so, you know, I, I agree with Mr. Rommel and Ms. Reiser. I mean, I was a legal services attorney for over eight years, represented 1,000 low-income Washtenaw County residents, so I know exactly how difficult it is for people to get through the court system when they're not represented, and I'm particularly um, adept at understanding those issues. So again, divorce workshops, packets, um, my judicial attorney will be there to answer procedural questions. While we can't give legal advice, we certainly can give information. So we will be very active in that regard with self-represented litigants. Um, I think one of the biggest issues is when you have one litigant who's represented and one litigant who's not. The um, self-represented litigants certainly can be abused by the other side. I've seen it happen, it's unfortunate, but sometimes when an attorney is on the other side, they take the opportunity to take advantage of that self-represented litigant. I will never allow that to happen. The rules of evidence say that I can answer question, ask questions, I can be involved, and if I'm not getting the information I need from that self-represented litigant because an attorney is shutting them down, I'm going to be active and ask questions and get involved because it's really not about who wins in family court, it's about the best interest of children. And so I'm going to do whatever I need to do to appropriately get all the information so I can make a best interest determination to help the children in that court. Um, I'm not there to play favorites. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to our next question and we'll begin with Mr. Rommel. Share your concept of alternative dispute resolution and how it might fit in your court. Under what circumstances do you think ADR is not appropriate? If you can, provide an, a case example. And when, it, and when it is not appropriate, how would you proceed in the problem solving process? Great question from the director of the Dispute Resolution Center. Thank you, Ms. Dolan. So this is a really interesting concept. So I, it is a, really, it comes down to a case by case basis. Litigation, I have learned in 36 plus years of litigation is not the best way to solve problems. It's the best way to do it is for parties to make their own peace. You know, people from uh, Jesus Christ, if you look at uh, Luke, where he talks about making peace with your accuser on the way to the magistrate, uh, Clarence Darrow, Abraham Lincoln, all talked about the benefit of making your own peace. And when you have equal bargaining power, that is absolutely true. We are blessed in this county. We have some terrific people, retired friend of court people, family law attorneys who do mediation, arbitration, the Dispute Resolution Center has free and low cost. Um, alternatives as well with trained people. I'm trained through the Dispute Resolution Center as a mediator myself, but it's not always appropriate. It's especially not appropriate when you have unequal bargaining power, when you have domestic violence. And this is where the judge needs to come in because the caution here is that a mediator, a private mediator adds to the cost of, of a family law case. It adds to the cost of a civil case. You know, lots of civil judges send their cases to mediation. Right now, the statistics are that 99% of civil cases do not go to jury trial. And so that we have this shadow system of resolving cases in mediation. And ultimately, we judges who are elected are gonna be the ones who are publicly accountable. And sometimes we need to control litigation. I'm involved in a family law appeal right now that has gone on for eight years with 800 uh, register of action entries involving domestic violence my client has owed well over $100,000 to her previous attorneys. I will not let that happen as a judge. If I let a case go on for eight years from a child being five years old to a teenager, I will have failed as a judge. Sometimes mediation may work. Sometimes the judge needs to step in, but we need to not put kids and families through that kind of thing. Thank you. Ms. Vandenberg. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, every case needs a case-by-case -case individualized attention of the judge. I will not have a standing mediation order. Um, I say that because many of our judges today do. People are required to go to mediation unless they opt out. 
That is not something that I favor. I want to eye on every single case myself and then allow the actual litigants to decide whether or not they think mediation is best for them. And the reason I say this is because I think people do best when they have buy-in. It's just like in therapy, people do best when they want to be there and when they have buy into the system. I am willing to hear every case that comes before the court. Unfortunately, mediation can add a lot of expense for people. It can also save people money. But again, we need a case by case approach. And also we really need to be able to, as a judge, I want to be able to be picking up on those cases that aren't appropriate for mediation, but may slide through the cracks in terms of domestic violence where you have power and control issues. Um, Listen, sometimes I feel like people in our courts feel like the judges won't hear their cases anymore, that they'll be punished if they won't go to mediation. I never want that to be an issue for someone in my court. I will sit down with them in chambers and talk to them myself. They don't need to go outside to a mediator um, if that's something they choose. I can certainly do that. I can have my judicial attorney help settle a case there in the hallway. We have a lot of great JAs who do that now in the court. Again, I'm a domestic mediator myself. Um, I have mediated cases and I think it can be a great tool, but I want people to understand that I will hear your case. And for some people, I've tried a number of family law cases that have failed the mediation numerous times and lawyers wouldn't even try their case. And they sent them to me and I tried it and my clients were satisfied with the results because in that case, that's what that case needed. Um, And so again, it's the individualized approach and it's a judge who's gonna be hands-on such as myself and is gonna hear every case before we decide where it's going. Thank you. Ms. Reiser. Thank you. I think it's a a great tool when the parties um, want to be involved in mediation. I think that the more that they're involved in a decision that's going to determine the outcome of uh, their family and and what's going to happen, uh, I think it's inappropriate as opposed to, you know, the judge ruling for or against you uh, when someone could sort of leave on a, on a bitter note. So if the parties are willing to do it, I'm definitely in favor of it. I think it's a very good tool. I also uh, will be able to recognize when cases aren't appropriate for mediation or if an attorney uh, says that they don't want to participate in mediation, I'm not going to force the individuals to take part in mediation. If there is uh, a power and control issue, if there are domestic violence victim in the relationship, then that's definitely not a case uh, that would be appropriate for mediation. So I think it is a great tool in working the case out and both sides can feel like they are invested and, and sort of have a say uh, in what happens in the relationship. But it doesn't need to happen in every single case. And I'll recognize um, if there's a domestic violence case that doesn't need to go to mediation. And I'll be certainly uh, ready and willing to hear that case. Thank you. We'll move to our next question and we'll start with Ms. Vandenberg on that, with that one. We've heard that there has been an increase in incidents of domestic violence. An ex parte petition is a request of the court for a personal protection order for safety without notice to the other party. Under what circumstances is it appropriate to grant the PPO uh, on an ex parte basis? How will you evaluate the risk to the petitioner? Well, in general, so the way that uh, risk is evaluated in an ex parte PPO is, is, is only on the pleadings. Um, So what I mean by that is it's only on the form that the petitioner fills out in order to issue ex parte. There's, um, so from that perspective, the allegations will be, have to be so significant and serious that there's an imminent risk to the petitioner that can't wait for a hearing. Um, And and that's essentially uh, the basis. Um, You know, one of the, the things that we're seeing now actually is in fact in Washtenaw, um, and, and I agree with you, Ms. Uh, Dylan, that, you know, we've talked a lot about the numbers going up. In Washington, our numbers have gone down, but we don't really believe in terms of domestic violence calls, but we don't really believe that's because um, domestic violence isn't happening. And I had talked to Barb Meese at Safe House about this. Um, we believe it's because, you know, at least up until the point we were all on uh, we stay at home orders, our survivors were unable to even get to the phone to, ex- you know, to escape from um, their abusers or to get help. 
Um, so I was very pleased to see that our judges ad uh, adapted and Judge Conlin, they've been hearing PPOs throughout this entire uh, pandemic. And as a matter of fact, as part of my campaign, one of the things that I, I did was do uh, several uh, informational videos so that people who were potentially in danger with their spouse during this quarantine um, knew that the court was still there for them. But essentially, again, in an ex parte order, it, they have to be significant issues that the person is, you know, at imminent risk and that their fear um, is is genuine and it's it's a tough call and it's a it's a high level but again i think we should err on the side of caution and that is that is the way that i would look at these types of issues always erring on the side of caution because someone does get a hearing after their after the ex parte order is issued thank you miss Fraser. I think you have to evaluate um, the affidavit and the petition for the personal protection order uh, when making that decision to issue an ex parte. Some of the things that you need to look for are um, if it is a domestic violence relationship, uh, oftentimes the violence will increase uh, when one partner leaves the relationship. So it's that leaving of the relationship that the incident of homicide will increase. So if you have a uh, petition request an ex parte order uh, where a relationship has ended and at the end of that relationship the violence is increasing uh, you need to issue that PPO ex parte to protect that individual who's requesting that. Another um, area that you look at a lot is stalking cases when the behavior becomes more brazen, uh, becomes more assaultive. If the individual uh, has been um, stalking the petitioner, uh, you must err on the side of caution and issue that PPO. So I think my 21 years of handling domestic violence and stalking cases uh, will bring a lot of experience in recognizing and reviewing those personal protection orders, uh, knowing the signs of violence, knowing when that risk is uh, increased for the person uh, requesting that personal protection order. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ramel? When I started doing these cases uh, over 36 years ago, uh, there was no PPO. You had to actually file a lawsuit. You had to go see a judge. You had to seek an injunction. If the judge granted an injunction without a hearing, you had to then, or, or set it for a hearing, what's called a show cause hearing, why an injunction shouldn't issue. Then you had to serve it yourself. You had to hire a process server, private process server. The law enforcement wouldn't do it for you. Now, that was a very terrifying experience. Now, PPOs are supposedly more user friendly. And what the issue is here is, even, is whether you put the burden on the person who is alleged to have done the violence or you put the burden on the person who is the alleged victim. And I had a case last year where I put together um, half an inch thick of the most horrific threatening text messages, stapled it to the PPO uh, application and asked for ex parte. I mean, I can certainly understand not granting an ex parte petition if you, know, you just have some allegations and they need to be tested but I've got the proof right there. Unfortunately, the judge has a reputation that he does not ever issue ex parte injunctions. And my client was terrified. She says, there is no way I am going to court. The, and she didn't, she dismissed her case because it's hard enough to go ahead and file the PPO and then you discourage them by saying, now you have to go and do it. Put the burden of proof on the person. If you have sufficient evidence in the petition, put the burden of proof on the persons who alleged to have done the thing. I wanna say this too. There's a lot of questions about domestic violence, which is great. We had a domestic violence forum a few weeks ago. Ms. Reiser and I participated. The third candidate chose not to. Her World Initiative put that on. If you do a YouTube search, you'll find some terrific in-depth questions about domestic violence and our answers to those questions. And I welcome you to, as you evaluate your uh, decision, to look at that as well. Thank you. We'll move to our next question. And we'll begin with Ms. Reiser. We know that Washtenaw County is diverse. What can you do to contribute or influence creating a court that reflects the community that it serves? Uh, to, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question to, to have the court sure. represent the community that it serves? 
I'll read it again. Yeah. We know that Washtenaw County is diverse. What can you do to contribute or influence creating a court that reflects the community that it serves? One of the things, and I talked about this in another, um, in another uh, forum, one of the things that I thought was really great when I started back at the prosecutor's office in 2002 is they had a court watch program. And it was volunteers that came in and watched the court from different parts of the community. So um, I would certainly look, the, the court staff that you hire is, is you have um, two individuals that work in the court um, office with you. Uh, I, I would invite um, high school classes in uh, into once we're back to school uh, to sort of teach the schools what the court system is about uh, to bring in some awareness of what happens in the court um, from all over Washtenaw County from the different schools. Uh, I try to start that um, court watch program. Uh, other than that, in terms of bringing people in that don't want to come into court, I mean, no one really wants to get a divorce. Uh, no one wants to have to file for a PPO. Uh, but just making that system for those individuals that do have to do that accessible and easy to use would be one of the goals uh, when I'm elected on the bench to make that um, easy for them to use. A lot of times, uh, victims that I represented in our criminal cases didn't have transportation to court. So I understand that that's a barrier uh, from some of our um, communities that are farther from the court downtown. It's difficult to get down there. Uh, and then once you get there to navigate through the court system. So, you know, maybe have once a month a, a program that sort of teaches what the court system's about and how to use it if you need to use it. If you need to use it for a personal protection order, partner with Safe House uh, to let individuals know that if you're ever in this situation, this is how you do it for all members of our community. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Rommel. We actually have two different communities we're talking about here. One is the broader community from east to west in our county that is diverse from, you know, Dexter to the west and Ypsilanti to the east and uh, Milan to the south, Whitmore Lake to the north, and the university towns of Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti in the middle. So the court community is very different. It's overrepresented uh, in criminal court by people of color. Uh, and it's overrepresented by people without means. And we have a system right now, there's a lot of talk about our justice system that uh, disproportionately um, encounters uh, those, that population, arrests that population, brings them into court, overcharges them, and sentences them disproportionately. What I called for is that in our county, um, courts are exempt from the Open Meetings Act. We only release the statistics that we want to release in the court. We should, what I'd like to do is do a top to bottom study where we determine whether we're treating fairly people of different races, different uh, backgrounds, immigrants, non-immigrants, people without means, and we release those statistics to the public to, to see what our problems are. And then we approach that as a court community and as a broader community to try to fix that system. So access to justice and fairness in the system is really the biggest issue. You know, we can also talk about things like training my staff in implicit bias, training my staff in diversity, um, in uh, diversity issues and domestic violence issues. And I believe that that's something that the entire court staff can get involved in. When we're talking about um, the mental health issues. Uh, you know, we have some great social workers working in the front of court, for example, who should be screening for those. They're screening for domestic violence. And I want to tap the expertise of all of those people who work in the court. One of the first things I will do is have a conversation with the people in the front of court, the clerks, the everybody else, and say, what can we do to make the court better and involve them in that conversation? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Vandenberg. Ms. Doolin, would you mind repeating the question? I'm sorry, one problem about being at home is that my dogs were simultaneously barking as you read no, it. I'm, I'm no, sorry. no problem, I'll read, it, I'll read it again. We know that Washtenaw County is diverse. What would you do to contribute or influence creating a court that reflects the community it serves? Absolutely. So one of the things that I am committed to doing is having a diverse court staff. Now, of course, I don't know exactly what that looks like at this point, but 
I think it's important for when people come to court to not just see people who look like myself or Mr. Armel or Ms. Reiser. Um, so that would be a goal of mine to have diverse people working in my chambers. Um, second of all, in terms of restorative justice, we have a great peacemaking court here in Washtenaw County. I've already spoken with Judge Connors about ways we can collaborate on expanding that. And I think one of the ways is to directly reach out to different communities, um, uh, dip, you know, in the, I'm sorry, different groups in the communities to get those individuals involved in the peacemaking process. So having representatives um, from the African American community, having representatives from the Latino community, having representatives from the Asian community trained in peacemaking and who can sit in peacemaking circles so that when somebody's involved in such a circle or involved in restorative justice, they're actually surrounded by people from their own community. You know, I think this is so important because it's one of the factors that really makes it difficult, I think, for people to trust judges, to trust staff. Um, Look, I mean, most of the people in the community, people of color in the community, black people in the community, they have had negative interactions with law enforcement. And if they've been at the court, they've had negative interactions at the court and they have no reason to trust us. And I understand that. So I am going to work really hard um, to you know, bring members of the community into my courts. I'm gonna have listening sessions all throughout the community. And um, so that, I find out what's going on and if I'm doing a good job. Listen, I work for you, I work for every member of the community and I'm gonna be out there, just like I'm out there now talking to members of the community. My campaign has already hit 19,000 doors. I'm walking around and we're super excited about talking to people and meeting them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that will conclude our questions. We'll move into our, uh, to the closing statements. We'll begin with you, Ms. Reiser. It's time for your closing statement. Thank you. Thank you for um, hosting um, this excellent event. I think one of the most important things is to be an informed voter. So we all appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to um, the citizens so they can be informed. Uh, I think one of the reasons um, and one of the things that makes me the most qualified candidate for this seat is the trial experience that I've had uh, over the last 21 years. Uh, I've spent my career trying cases, trying domestic violence cases, drunk driving cases, stalking cases, homicide cases, sexual assault cases. And that trial experience um, is something uh, that the other candidates don't have. I've spent years in the circuit court before all of the circuit court judges handling cases there, uh, working with victims in our community. Uh, to, to bring justice, to bring a voice for those victims. And those families that I work with, uh, dealing with trauma will be an asset to the family court bench because when you're going through a divorce, it's a traumatic experience. Um, I've been a public servant uh, serving the community uh, for nearly 20 years here in Washtenaw County. I'm not a politician. Uh, so what I want to do is continue to serve the community. So I would ask that you visit my website, amyreiser.com. One of the things that, one of the neat things that I learned along this campaign trail uh, was from a juror who served on one of my cases uh, last summer. And so I can tell you how great I am, what an excellent judge I will be. But I think if you visit my website uh, and look at what the juror said about my work, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Rommel. Sure, thanks. So I have talked about my experience and I've talked about justice reform. And one of the things about justice reform is transparency. And that starts with the campaign. When I say I have the most expense, extensive experience of any candidate, I'm very transparent about that. I tell you exactly how many years I practiced, 36 years plus, two years as a student attorney. I've done over 50 trials to verdict as sole counsel, over 30 jury trials to verdict. I have done both criminal and civil cases to verdict. I have done hundreds more cases uh, in terms of arbitrations, labor arbitrations, mediations. I've done hundreds and hundreds of depositions. And the other thing you need to know about me in terms of transparency when you know what I get is you know who I've represented. I've always represented the plaintiff in a civil case and a criminal defendant. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be biased because you can tell from my peer ratings that I have the respect of people on the other side. And when they endorse me and they donate to me, 
it's very meaningful to me. But I have the only, I have the most extensive experience. And when we, the chief judge has stated after two years, there are no guarantees about what this DACA will be. The history of this court is that no judge can predict or promise their docket. The history of this court is that you have to be prepared to do everything. And I will do it. And I have the social justice background and the heart. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rommel. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Vandenberg. You're muted. Okay. I'm sitting up here with some very fine attorneys. All of us have been ranked by our peers as highly qualified by one legal organization or another. And we all have a lot of experience in the courtroom. We've all tried a lot of cases. And if you're a victim of a crime, I want you to call Amy. She's an excellent prosecutor. She's been a prosecutor her entire career. And if you've lost your job and need an employment lawyer, you should call Nick because he has pr been primarily practicing employment law for the last 20 years. I'm a trial lawyer with expertise in family law and a clinical social worker. And that is why I am uniquely qualified to fill this seat. As a clinical social worker, I treated hundreds of individuals with mental health and substance abuse issues. As a trial lawyer, I've tried dozens of cases and represented family law clients multiple times at trial and on appeal to the Michigan Supreme Court. No other candidate has the expertise in family law that I bring to the bench. And no other candidate in the race has the professional training to not only comprehensively address the legal issues that come before the court, but the professional training to address the societal issues that come before the court. Mental illness, child abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence. And that is why I have more judicial endorsements than any other candidate in this race, including Washtenaw Chief Judge Carol Kunke, head of the family court, Circuit Court Judge Pat Conlon, and peacemaking Judge Tim Connors. Thank, thank you. I, I ask thank, for your vote. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the candidates. Uh, we appreciate you, your participation in this very valuable session. I will now turn things back over to Mr. Sean for the closing comments. The League of Women Voters, the Dispute Resolution Center, and the Washtenaw County Bar Association thank the candidates who participated in tonight's forum and to those who contributed questions as well. All our candidate forums will be available for streaming on your computer or smartphone. Go to our website, lwvannarbor.org, and look for the link to the programs. In addition, the forums can be viewed on CTN Channel 13 and at the DRC Facebook page at Dispute Resolution Center A2. Please urge your friends and neighbors to watch these forums as well. For additional nonpartisan information on candidates and ballot issues, go to vote411.org, the League's Voter Resource Guide, covering local, state, and federal candidates and current proposals that will appear on your ballot. As a reminder, all voters are now eligible to cast an absentee ballot. In addition, while voters are encouraged to register ahead of time, Michigan law now provides for same day registration. So remember, no matter how you do it, by absentee ballot or by in per going in person to the polls, make sure you vote in the August 4th primary election. Good evening.